I, uh, my name is John, I'm one of the co-founders at Enigma. My background is like, more on the uh, non-technical side, so I, I work with uh, projects in the space to find partners to, to build on us, build with us. Um, and I'm going to do a very quick intro um, and then pass it on to Fred who will get into uh, more details about it. Uh, we have a pretty generic presentation, so I'm going to like uh, pass the first uh, part a bit, but um, like at Enigma, we're we're building the privacy layer for uh, for for the decentralized future. We were all very very interested in the idea of decentralization, but uh, and and I we all were um, are super excited with blockchain, but we think blockchain alone uh, is not enough, and you actually need to add privacy to the equation in order to achieve the full benefits of. Uh, of decentralization and with that we started our work in uh, in 2015 as a research project at MIT and then um, fast forward a couple of years uh, this turned into a company and um, and right now we're working on on Enigma um, I think the problem of privacy is, is is very obvious to everyone all the data we have is, is visible that's not something we like um, and what, what we're building is we're building a decentralized uh, computation protocol, uh, the privacy uh, layer where where nodes, uh, distributed nodes, can compute over encrypted data without seeing uh, the underlying data. Uh, with that, we introduce this concept of secret contracts, which are um, very similar to what Ethereum uh, popularized, but uh, with the only difference that the data that goes into the, the contracts are not visible. Uh, and Fred will talk, tell in more detail about how that works. Uh, we do this in two ways. Um, our research has been based on multi-party computation. Um, yet the initial version of the network uses um, a hardware solution, uh, more precisely Intel SGX. Uh, the reason we, we chose that is because we can do much more, um, much faster uh, in a much performant way. And we still use MPC to, um, to secure the uh, the, the TE-based network when it comes to key, ma uh, key management. Um, I want to spend some time on this and then pass it on to Fred. Um, um, with this, like, we realize there are a lot of Ethereum applications that, that would benefit from privacy right now. When we first started looking into this, to us it was all about how to preserve data, data, in, like, data privacy and how to deal with sensitive data. But one thing that we're also recognizing along the way is there are uh, UX impact uh, of using this kind of secret contracts instead of uh, instead of um, just like uh, you know uh, doing uh, things uh, regularly on a smart contract. So one area that we're doing a lot of work in uh, is is uh, is governance. Um, obviously, in governance, there's this aspect of um, of votes being uh, visible is not great because. If I get to see your votes at any point, I can contractually bribe you, right? Put some money in a contract and say, if you vote my way, then uh, I'm gonna pay you. And I think that's very dangerous to the whole idea of decentralization that we're, we're very excited about. But more so, one thing that we found out is most projects use a scheme called commit reveal right now, which requires the individual to first commit a hash of their vote and then at a later time reveal it. And uh, the, the fact that users have to do two transactions is, is is very um, uh, unfriendly from a UX perspective. Um, so we see that a lot of people want to use this just to improve the, the usability. And uh, on the governance side, right now, Ocean Protocol and Aragon is working uh, with our libraries um, to to include in their uh, TCR designs. Um, we're uh, very interested in the ideas of auctions, um, being able to do sealed with auctions. And like, if you think about auctions that are double-sided, then you construct an order book. Um, and and what, what, with what we have, we can create private order books. So one thing that we will start <coughs> working on in the next two months is we're going to collaborate with 0x to, to do um, a dark relay for them. Right now, all the 0x relayers are centralized. And they have this problem of front running because everyone sees the orders coming in. But if you're able to build a dark relayer, then what you have is like no one gets to see what the bids and asks are. So you can eliminate the problem of front running. Um, and also this can become something like a dark pool where people can uh, can transact large amounts of tokens without being exposed to uh, <coughs> to the market. Um, 
we're talking to a lot of gaming companies. Um, Loom and Decentraland are, are folks that uh, we're in constant conversation with. And with gaming, things like, okay, um, like imagine when you're playing Mario, right? There's a box, you need to break it, and sometimes there's something good that comes out. Sometimes there's something that's trying to kill you that comes out. So with that kind of functionality, you can't really do right now because everything uh, is, is, is visible. So we're, we're, we're talking to gaming companies to figure out how we can do um, games like that or like if you're doing poker, how you can make sure that no one gets to see their hands but still be able to play that. Um, one kind of exciting idea that's uh, out there is this concept of secret ICOs. Um, our network has included state, which means if you're able to do, if you're able to generate a token on this network, then you end up with a token that has uh, like Zcash like properties. Um, obviously, we need to do much more testing before we get there, but that's something that we can enable down the road. Um, and then this other application that I'm personally very interested in is this identity uh, vertical that we're working on. Um, I think we all have a shit ton of um, digital footprint that we create in, uh, in Web 2.0 that we don't get to use. And a question that, um, that we ask ourselves is how can we make this data relevant in the, in the Web 3.0 space uh, while preserving your privacy? And I'm going to go over an example right now. So um, we're working with this company called Data Wallet uh, out of Berlin. Uh, and like what they want to do is they're, they're more focused on this idea of ad fraud, like bots clicking on ads is like I, apparently like causes a billions of dollars to disappear every year um, and and they're focused to solve that and the way they solve that is they get your Facebook data and they run an algorithm centrally and um, and and with that algorithm they can determine whether you are a legitimate person or a bot uh, but if you think about it like you're giving your data to an obscure startup um, like even if Facebook's leaking your data like I would not want to trust uh, like a 10 people team to do that so what we're um, what we're working to do with them is to say actually um, you can run this algorithm of yours as a secret contract on our uh, protocol. Uh, so this would run in a decentralized way, and the user data would flow in to the network in an encrypted way. So what happens is no one gets to see your data. You're not at the mercy of a single company, and you can determine, like throughout the network computation, whether this is, uh, you know, whether an individual is a bot or not. And with that, we can uh, like create like an ERC seven twenty five, which can be used for like let's say you want to participate in a blockchain uh, voting uh, thing, and then you know you need to prove that you're 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 a unique person, or you want to do um, like airdrops and whatnot, and you want to limit uh, participation to a single person. So. Um, those are the kind of like uh, blockchain applications that, that we're interested that this can uh, help it. Also, like there's a lot of like decentralized finance applications that are um, getting traction, like Dharma, like a lot of lending things. With that, like underwriters etc. need to be verified. So we think this is a this is a great way to um, to alleviate the identity and and cyber attack problem in the blockchain world. Uh, now I'm going to pass it to Fred to uh, get more details into how things actually work under the hood. Um, my name is uh, Frédéric, and um, I'm an engineer at Enigma, and uh, I work on the implementation of, you know, I suppose code and the different module. We have like, what, 12 engineers right now, uh, so we're a team working on the implementation. Uh, <clears throat> so this uh, float or this sequence diagram here is meant to represent um, a particular um, use case on how we would use the Enigma network in context of a particular project. And this particular project is uh, what we're working on with uh, Data Wallet, the bottleneck that that John just described. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if it's super accurate, but I think it, it will kind of um, uh, explain the, the idea and how a project might integrate with Enigma. So I'm just going to go over it briefly. So in this particular instance, um, what would happen is that uh, there will be a <coughs> DAP. Uh, in, in this case, 
and, and we're talking about like an Ethereum DApp. So like what we're trying to do is make our Enigma network compatible with existing Ethereum DApp. And we've made several design decisions to really um, design our application in a way that is uh, kind of user friendly to uh, to users of an existing Ethereum DApp. So in this case, the client would be the DApp user of the data wallet, you know, Ethereum DApp. Um, it would um, fetch its data from Facebook, and then that data is being returned. So the data wallet app here, um, you know, we can consider it like a generic Ethereum DApp essentially. Like it's a it's a Ethereum DApp that data wallet is <coughs> interfacing with their Ethereum smart contract. So in this case, the user would go and fetch his data from Facebook, return it to the data wallet app. Uh, the data wallet app <coughs> does, does some magic there to basically determine whether the to, to, to kind of um, I don't know what it does actually exactly. Like to, it cleans up, I suppose, the, the data that's been fetched from Facebook. Um, then um, essentially, the data wallet that um, wants to use the Enigma network to determine, based on that data, whether uh, the user is a bot or not a bot. So now it, it gets to how our network function. Uh, I'm going to explain that at a very high level in, in the context of this diagram. And then the next slide is more about like, explaining how Enigma works exactly. Uh, so this may not make total sense here, but should make more sense later. So essentially, the way it works is that the data wallet DAP would um, submit a hash of um, the data that it wants to send to the Enigma network. Um, so we have this concept of uh, task ID, which is a hash of uh, the inputs that we're sending to Enigma. So essentially, Enigma works as a network, but it's not really a blockchain in the sense that it doesn't have a consensus layer on, on its own, at least not right now. So it uses it uses Ethereum as the consent as uh, the final consensus layer, uh, but it's a network of nodes which have uh, states and exchange messages and process uh, computations, which we call secret contract. So essentially, uh, the data wallet DAP would submit a hash of the input of the of the bot or not computation to Ethereum. This creates what we call a transaction record. Then once this transaction record is created, um, the data wallet DAP would then submit the actual inputs encrypted into the Enigma network. Uh, the Enigma network would decrypt them, will run the code. So the code is essentially code that uh, the data wallet, I guess, contract owner built. Uh, and it's something called a secret contract. So we've developed our own um, kind of smart contract engine. It's based on WebAssembly. We call it secret contract. And essentially, you can write code, and um, this code can run on the Enigma network. And this code is runs privately. So here, in this case, we've encrypted the inputs to this bot or not piece of code. and the bot or not contract itself has public publicly auditable code but it executes privately so we send uh encrypted inputs to it the code executes it executes in a private enclave um and the results themselves are then uh returned to ethereum so that in an ethereum contract there's a it's kind of a final ver verdict as to whether um, the user is a bot or not. So I'm not, sure, I'm not sure. I don't know. I hope that makes some sense. So basically, like the idea here is that the the, um, the actual uh, data set of the user that that came from Facebook was encrypted on a client, so that no one could see that data except for the client who encrypted it. That client submitted this encrypted data to the Enigma network. The Enigma network ran some computation on it <coughs> without revealing the data to anyone. So basically, it decrypted it in, in a very specific way, which I'm going to explain later, so that that data has never been revealed to any uh, kind of human or any kind of entity that could uh, potentially leak that data. And then it computed an aggregate, essentially, which basically took all of this complex social graph or whatever 
or account data was submitted from Facebook and computed an aggregate that or compute the final result that, that says if the user is a bot or not. And then the new network was able to call uh, Ethereum and just commit that final result. And then now you have an Ethereum smart contract with a registry of users that have been validated and, uh, as to whether they are a bot or not. And that information can be used for different applications that require authentication of users. Okay, now I'm gonna go into more of the specific of what um, of how that works, like under the cover, like how the Enigma network actually works to achieve this. Uh, we'll go over this, uh, this diagram, um, which is a very high level diagram, which kind of explains uh, the parts that are involved in the Enigma network, like the different subsystems and how they work. I'll try to go over them in order. Uh, and I want to make this very interactive um, so that uh, you guys have a chance to ask your questions and that I think will determine like to which level of detail we want to go with this presentation um, because I think a lot of your questions might determine like which points are the most important to focus on and, and kind of do this live together. So the way this works is that we have the Enigma network. Uh, the Enigma network is a set of nodes um, that uh, are that function together similar to a blockchain except that the Enigma network doesn't have a ledger and a final consensus algorithm. It relies on Ethereum for this, at least for right now. Uh, our goal is to be able to port the Enigma network to perhaps other, other blockchains, maybe be our own chain in the future or something like that, but right now, uh, Ethereum is our final consensus layer. Uh, the Enigma network has a secret contract, uh, and a secret contract, as I alluded to earlier, is uh, a contract, uh, like a smart contract framework that we built. Actually, we extended something that Parity started, uh, which is PWASM. And we extended that to provide other functionality. And essentially, um, it's uh, a, a smart contract framework that allow Enigma developers to build a smart contract that will execute privately. Um, we use Wasm to run. Uh, you know, we use Wasm as a runtime. Um, and yeah, so these are our secret contract. So in order to <coughs> If you're a developer and you want to use the Enigma network, then you have to build these secret contracts and you have to deploy them. And we have a deployment mechanism, which I'm not going to go into uh, right now. But essentially, the, the, important, part, the important point is that um, we offer developer tools to build these secret contracts. They're based on Rust. We have some special Rust libraries that help you build, build them so that they look like a secret contract. And um, then they can be deployed and they can be executed. Uh, What's that? Deployed where? Uh, okay, the way, the way that they're deployed is um, the Enigma network is a set of nodes that can store data. We use libp2p for uh, the communication between the nodes, and we also use it to uh, <coughs> persist data, a little bit like, like our internal version of IPFS, if you will. So th this is where the bytecode of the contracts are stored. Mm. Uh, but because we use Ethereum as our sort of final consensus, we store a hash of that bytecode on Ethereum, which is kind of the source of truth. So like if we want to know uh, what, like if you have the bytecode of a, of a secret contract and we, you want to know if that is the active contract deployed uh, on the network at the moment, then you can verify that on, on the Ethereum chain. So essentially like just in general for secret contract and also for all, all of the other data, we store the data on our own network, but we use hashes strategically, I guess, saved on the Ethereum network to represent like kind of the source of truth about you know um, about, about that data. Does that makes sense. Uh, so the way it works is that um, so we have a bunch of secret contract deployed, um, uh, and uh, for each epoch. Um, we do a rotation, so hold on a I feel like this is a bit backwards. Um, okay, so I want to go to this con to this box here, the concept of a worker. So we have uh, again a network of nodes uh, that are analogous to miners in, on Ethereum or, or, or Bitcoin. Essentially, our nodes are there to run computation tasks of these secret contracts. So we have these secret contracts that are deployed in our network, and essentially 
these secret contracts have public functions that do <coughs> stuff, and um, some entities have to basically run uh, these computations. And these are the workers. So the workers are um, the workers are essentially the nodes, and the workers are the ones running the computations. And the way it works is that um, for each contract, for each epoch, we select a number of workers to be responsible for running the computations for those contracts. Um, so, for example, if we have an, uh, a voting contract deployed on a network, and that's a popular contract that cons cons constantly gets some tasks, then every epoch we will rotate and select uh, a group of worker that will be responsible for running the computation for this epoch. And the benefit for those workers of, of running the computations you know, for that amount of time is that they'll get a reward. So essentially, if I'm a DAP user, and I, uh, if I'm a DAP user here, and I, um, and I request some computations from the network, um, the workers assigned for that epoch would uh, run the computations, and they will get the rewards essentially. Um, so, specifically, how that works, um, the comp each computation task starts from a DAP user, so. Um, a DAP user is similar to an Ethereum DAP user. Essentially, it's it's just it's just a DAP. Uh, we've written we wrote a JavaScript library, which basically is a wrapper to the web to Web three, which allows to do some you know Enigma specific operations. So the DAP user will um, will invoke a comp will invoke a function of a secret contract that will run on a Enigma network. And how that works specifically is that um, it works in, in, in two steps. So first, the DAP user will um, execute a transaction on Ethereum with a hash of the inputs of uh, the computation task. So imagine a, a secret contract contains a function, and this function has some parameters. The DAP user has the values of these parameters, the parameters that it wants to compute. So for example, say it's a voting function, the DAP user has which way it wants to vote. So the DAP user will uh, package all of this together. So basically the function name, the, the values of the arguments of the functions, some other, some other attributes, and will uh, first create a hash of all of these inputs and commit that on Ethereum. So that's what we call a, a task record. So it will commit a task record on Ethereum. Then once this task record is created, uh, it will send these inputs in the uh, Enigma network itself for computation. Uh, and it will send these inputs encrypted, okay? So we have a task record on Ethereum, and then we have a set of encrypted inputs that are being sent to the Enigma network. Uh, the way that the DAP user communicates with the Enigma network is similar to how it communicates with the Ethereum network. Basically, it connects to a node of the Enigma network, and that node will receive the encrypted inputs and distribute it to the other nodes. And essentially, ultimately, um, these inputs will be computed once they're received by the, <coughs> work, the worker node selected for that contract for that epoch. So essentially, the DAP user sends uh, the inputs to the Enigma network, it kind of, it's being propagated to uh, a number of nodes of the Enigma network. The worker nodes that have been selected for that epoch receive this, they compute it, and, um, and then, and then, uh, um, and then results are being calculated from that. Um, does that make any sense so far, or do you, do you guys have questions about this flow? Yeah, right. So the, the, the integrity, you know, the fact that the, the that the computation has been done correctly, yeah. is that just a trust assumption on your own play, or uh, are you separately yeah. okay. validating that? Okay, great. So yeah, I, I wanted to get to that. So, okay, th th thanks for, so thanks for, for bringing that point. So yes, um, we are using Intel SGX. Uh, so we are using trusted execution environments. Uh, to run these computations. So these workers, uh, they need to have special hardware, essentially. They need to have uh, this Intel SGX chip 
you know, I'll come back to it a little bit later, maybe to, to explain how, how remote attestation works and exactly like how IntelliJX works. But the idea is that each of the workers will run these computation instead of these trusted execution environments, which are uh, hardware enclaves in the chip itself, in the CPU. Um, and uh, how we know that the computations are, how we account for correctness is uh, using a few, um, like we, we, we're using a, a few attributes for this. So first of all, um, we ensure that the inputs of the computations are accurate, like using some, 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 some validation along the way. So um, when a DAP user submits uh, a task to the network, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, it creates a hash of all of its input and it commits it on chain on Ethereum. So this hash is being used by the worker when it receives the computation to make sure, okay, the inputs that I'm receiving now, I can create an, a hash from them and verify that the hash of these inputs matches the hash that I have on chain. So now I'm a, as a worker, I know that I have like the right inputs. Now I can compute, I can compute this in my enclave and um, return some result, and we n know that the output are correct because they've been computed in an enclave. So we we do rely on the enclave being um, uncompromised to make sure that the inputs are correct. Um, and the way that we do that more rob robustly, because. Enclaves are tricky. There are some theoretical attacks that have been um, mounted against some enclaves. Uh, so we want to have another layer of security to make sure that, like, I guess what we're trying to do is to avoid like a single enclave having too much um, trust. Um, so what we do is we have a quorum of um, workers working on each of the tasks and essentially each of these workers, so let's say I'm sending one task to the network and there's a quorum of five workers assigned to work <laughs> on that task, then each of these workers will be responsible for computing the same uh, task and they would sort of, we have a, a consensus algorithm, we have an internal consensus algorithm that um, allowed those workers to sort of self-verify. So if I have five workers working on the same uh, task, then the expectation is that the, the, the five workers are going to arrive at the same result. Otherwise, we have some, some mechanism to deal with that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how we ensure correctness is one, by the properties of the enclave, which are pretty robust, and two, by having multiple workers doing the same operations, kind of cross validating each other, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, a question? I have a question. Um, I think that um, the problem of these uh, secure enclaves is not that they do the wrong computation, but uh, they could leak um, keys, for example. Yep. I think this is a bigger problem for these contracts. Yeah, uh, it, it's 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 a problem. So I can tell you how we're kind of managing this. <laughs> so first of all, like yeah, I mean these attacks are pretty tricky. So I'm I'm, I'm going to respond to this in a couple of ways because obviously there's not one answer to this, like there's more like mitigations that, that, we, that, that we thought of and that we're working on. So first thing first is that uh, we have, and in this mean we have someone else in the company who's like uh, working with Intel and kind of, kind of uh, on the research side, like really following these sorts, of, uh, these sorts of attacks so that we can fully understand their scope. Some of these attacks are more theoretical. Some of them are more practical. And so we're trying to understand like the actual damage that these attacks can cause and how much we can um, mitigate them with code, you know, by, you know, keeping our memory safe and stuff like that. So first of all, like, this is like kind of the first phase of really understanding the attack and, and try to understand what we can do with software to sort of limit what can be exposed. But also, like, isn't like those attacks to sneak keys from a single enclave, right? So in this network, there is a constant, uh, let's say, a tr transition of keys across the nodes uh, to access the state. So it's it's very different than, than like let's say, 
the attack you have in a theoretical setting on, on one enclave to, to leak the results. Yeah, I think that that's that's sort of the second mitigation. I if, if I understand what 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 you're getting at that that I want to talk about is the the key management. So essentially, we have a separate key management module which is responsible for holding the keys uh, securely. Uh, this key management, we're releasing it in two different phases. Um, but essentially, like we have some nodes that are designated to ma to to hold the keys that. Uh, can encrypt and decrypt the state of the contract and what we do is we make sure that the enclaves only have access to those keys for a very short period of time basically when they are selected as a worker so if there was a, a successful attack against these enclaves and you could potentially read data from it um, what we're trying to do is to kind of limit the damage by uh, only temporary, temporarily storing the encryption key in those enclaves so that if you could uh, crack an enclave and read data from it and read a key from it, then you know you would be able to read one key for one contract and you wouldn't be able to predict because these, these uh, workers are selected kind of at random, right? So like if you were able to crack an, uh, an enclave, you would need to be able to predict when that enclave is gonna be selected for the contract that you're interested in and then at that point you would have a, a short window to be able to read that key and decrypt the data. So like we're trying to make it as hard as possible to for these kinds of attacks to be possible. So, uh, and then the, the, the third thing that I would say is that um, in parallel, this is kind of the wor version one of the network where we mostly rely on, on enclaves and group of enclaves to, to run the computation. Um, but the other area that we're working on right now, which is a bit more work, but it, this is something that we're actively working on. We're not going to release it on, on our first release, but it's going to be on, the, on our second release that's coming up next year is, uh, is MPC, right? So uh, instead of having a group of enclaves that are running on the same computation, that are running the same computation and, and cross-verifying the results, what we're trying to do is to have a group of enclaves that are running chunks of like basically implementing MPC, like running uh, this run computation, but with with holding only a partial data set. And uh, that is with a lot more robust because if one of the enclave was compromised, then the best that the attacker could, could get is like a partial set of data about the computation, which is meaningless on its own. So the attacker would be able to predict which enclave are gonna be selected for this computation and then be able to crack all of these enclaves all at the same time and you know these enclaves are all distributed all across the network so like an attack once we have this uh, MPC enable would be like very 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 <coughs> difficult to, to mount at that point so like we know these things and when we're like um, really trying to mitigate it we're being pragmatic also and we definitely have like the plan to make it super robust with, with MPC, but for this first version, we won't have an MPC. So there's still like the, 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 the slight possibility that, um, that an enclave could be compromised and we're trying to limit the damage if that happens. Yeah. I'm um, just going back a step to the um, parameters that go in. Um, you mentioned that they, the user will have a hash uh, of their parameters and that's what is checked uh, yep. by the worker. Um, mm -hmm. Does the worker decrypt it outside of the enclave or is the sort of decryption and then processing passing um, to be done inside the enclave? Uh, okay, so the way it works is uh, the hash is created by the DAP user. Yeah. So using all of the um, parameters of the task. So basically the parameters of the task are the function, so a signature. Uh, well, I guess to be specific, yep. you, like if the parameters say um, for the function is like the vote, like if it's a voting vote, thing yeah. and, it, and that parameter um, is sent over encrypted, yep. is it the worker that decrypts it first and then passes it to the enclave to process? Or, or is it sort of deferred to all be inside, like the decryption and processing has to be inside the uh, secure enclave? Uh, okay, th so the voter would be the DAP user in this case, so yeah. he has it on the clear because he's the one like kind of de determining the vote. So the 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 hash would be based on the vote on the clear. Then uh, the DAP user will will encrypt it, and we use some Diffie-Hellman key exchange like to be able to basically securely send 
that data between the DAP user and, and the worker that's that's going to work on it. Mm -hmm. Then the worker <coughs> receives this encrypted you know package of inputs, decrypt it, okay. and then from there re re recreate the same hash, okay. and then ensures that the the hash matches the record on chain. So that's but to answer your question, worker is the enclave. Yeah. It's not like uh, well, worker and enclave <laughs> are the same thing. But but I thought there was maybe some processing outside of the enclave, which no, is decryption. And well, everything takes in place yeah, inside the enclave. Yeah, decryption so takes place okay. in the enclave, yeah. the verification of the hash takes place in the gotcha. enclave yeah. or whatever. Thanks. The only thing that's kind of uh, maybe outside of the enclave is exchanging uh, encrypted packages, essentially, like some networking functions that, um, that uh, you know, are required to, like, dispatch messages between the nodes. But everything that has to do with encryption, decryption, uh, processing, everything is done inside of the enclave. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, yeah. Uh, what does this state look like? Uh, okay, so uh, yeah, so each uh, secret contract has a state, and then you can easily visualize a state uh, by analogy if you consider an Ethereum smart contract. So it's kind of similar, right? Like you you create your secret contract, and you have attributes that you can save, and that becomes part part of the state. And uh, the way it works is. Um, our state is a series of delta. So because our state is encrypted, like the attributes are a bit different because uh, then, then if we had like a decrypted, a <coughs> decrypted state, so uh, what we do is we manage our state by delta. So if, for example, you started a secret contract and you initialize it, uh, maybe it's empty. Then you call a function of the, of the secret contract which saves something to the state. That will create a delta. Uh, and that delta is uh, that delta will be saved encrypted in uh, uh, to disk essentially, S and then you know you call another function, it, it does something else, then it creates another delta that's that's being saved to disk. So and then when a new worker is selected uh, to continue working on that contract, because remember every epoch we, we kind of switch over the contracts, so. When a new worker is selected to work on the same contract because the epoch changed, uh, this uh, worker is going to take all of these state delta and replay them in its enclave in memory. So it takes all of this encrypted state delta, replay them in memory in its enclave. So we end up with like a full state that only exists inside of the enclave in memory. So the full state itself is never like sort of persisted to disk in any way. It only exists in memory. The only thing that's persisted to disk is a series of uh, state delta that can be replayed in, in an enclave uh, subsequently. And the state delta are always encrypted. Does that make sense? Or? Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay. Uh, just wondering why. Uh, <laughs> what makes it encrypted? Why is it compacted? Uh, it's not compacted. Because it will grow over time, so like significant amounts. Yeah, it will grow over time. Uh, yeah, it will. It, 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 it will go over time to a number of state that, that will have to be replayed uh, in, in the contract. Yeah. So and the, the reason why we do that is because we can easily um, exchange. So let's say we have a quorum of workers. We want to be able to easily uh, exchange state update between the different workers that are part of that quorum. But the question is if I add a new worker to the yeah. quorum and I want to transfer to these states, I could do I'll have to, to replay all the updates. From yeah. The yeah. If if you're a new worker and you uh, join the network, uh, you will receive all of the state delta for the contract. And as you become the selected worker, then you would replay all of these uh, deltas in memory, and then you'll have basically the full state to work with in, in, in your enclave. Mm. Mm. So it's it's not. I don't think it's significantly more storage than storing the full state encrypted. <coughs> it's just that it's stored in chunks, as opposed to being stored, you know, as. Well, it might depend on the application. If my application just changes some values, yeah. So like every time, every delta is just like plus minus some some amount to my balance. At the end, the full state is just a balance, just a number. Yeah. Right? But the the full history of the balance is like very long. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point, and um, we may look at optimizing that. Actually, like right now, that's sort of the way we have it. 
but we are actually considering some optimization where perhaps after an epoch then we consolidate the state mm -hmm. and then we only use the state delta like within the epoch because mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that is something we talked about but I guess for right now for the version that we have right now like we're just dealing with the state delta for, for the lifetime of the, of the contract but that is a good point um, and, and something that, that, that we can see. Um, can you talk a bit more about your implementation, your client implementation of NPC, and like how general that would be? Like, will you be able to compute any type of secret contract with NPC? Yeah, that's that's the idea. Um, I'm not the one researching NPC specifically, so I think we have other people in our team that could like s speak to it in more details. Sure. But the idea is that we are working on um, like a compiler to be able to compile a smart or smart contract in a way that, that, that will work with NPC so uh, and that will be general purpose as far as we can um, uh, use WebAssembly um, based uh, contract and, and, and use them with NPC uh, but you know this we're still doing a lot of research sure. on that, and there might be limitations that I'm not aware of at the yeah. moment. But uh, that is the intent. Do you know about the effect on like network speed it'll have? It will have an effect, but you know what's interesting? The way that we're starting with SGX is because we think that it plays nice with MPC because um, th because of the fact that we have SGX and there is some trust that we can put in SGX, mm. even though maybe it's not perfect. That would allow us to have some smaller MPC clusters than if. We had, we didn't have that that level of protection to begin with. Right. So is the intention that some computations will still take place in an SGX environment, and then only the ones that really need to be secure will be by MPC? Or yeah, yeah, or more like it, it might be an option. I, like, and again, like we made this, we, we these decisions are, are kind of maybe not final, but sure, sure. At, the way I envision it is that. Everything would every worker would always use SGX, okay. except that some of them will have um, would use MPC on top of it, which means that you have a fairly small MPC cluster because you have SGX uh, on top of it, which gives you some defense. Because if you didn't have SGX and you just had MPC, then uh, you would need more nodes to to ensure that um, you know the majority of your of your MPC cl cluster is being honest. So. Because we use SGX, we can afford to have like a, a smaller uh, uh, MPC cluster. Uh, I think so in terms of speed, like <laughs> state of art, uh, up to 100 nodes, you can get decent uh, okay. performance. Obviously, like with something like 10, it's much faster. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, like once you go above 100, then it becomes slow. Okay. okay. Thanks. Yeah. Besides uh, uh, a lot of your MPC computations, um, what are you doing to mitigate like today, uh, attacks against uh, enclaves such as like like a foreshadow attack that was just recently published, where it leaks the attestation keys of SGX. I think we went over that. Let's take it offline. Sure. Uh, okay. Um. How do you identify the workers in the uh, instances? Okay. So yeah. Um, so, the way it works, we have a staking uh, mechanism. So, if you want to register as a worker, you have to stake some tokens, and you have to stake some uh, some of our token, ENG tokens. And um, so, if you want to be a worker, there's two things you need to do. First, you have you have to have SGX, an SGS, an SGS chip, and we have a registration process in which the network is able to validate your the authenticity of your chip. Um, and I can I can go over that later if you want. Once it's validated, you have to stake some tokens. And uh, for every epoch, we, as I mentioned earlier, we kind of, we kind of reshuffle the worker that are, that are going to be assigned to work on a, on a given contract. And the reshuffling is done um, randomly, weighted on the number of tokens that you have um, staked. So if you're uh, have staked a lot of token, and another user has staked very few tokens, then you have a much higher chance to be selected as a worker. That means that the more token you stake, the more income you can generate from, from being a uh, worker. Uh, so so that, that's essentially how it works. And also, like, we have an internal consensus between, um, so for example, um, for a given contract in Epoch, there's a group of workers that are being selected to 
uh, work on the secret contract. And there's also an incentive of computing um, faster than other nodes. So the, the nodes that have been selected but can't compute faster than, let's say, the majority of the, the group that's been selected are not going to get rewards at that point. So like, to get the rewards, you have to stake, you have to be selected, and you also have to be able to compete faster than um, some of the nodes that are assigned to your group, essentially. And this is happening on the trade this consensus? <coughs> uh, this consensus is done internally uh, between the nodes. Uh, uh, it's, ki it's kind of charted, so like the consensus is done between the nodes that, are being that, are, that have been selected for a given contract, for a given impact, just to synchronize the state. And then um, once this internal consensus is done, um, these, the results of these tasks are being submitted to Ethereum <coughs> for like, final consensus and also for publicly ver verifiable proof that live on Ethereum subsequently. Okay, can I talk a bit more about the verification process? Like, how, how does the network ver verify the authenticity of the checks? Do, do we need to interact with Intel servers somehow? Yeah, uh, I think I have a diagram here somewhere. Oh, yeah, this one. Okay. So, this is kind of the generic diagram that shows how um, basically remote authentication works. So uh, for a new n worker to, to register, first of all, you have to have an, un an enclave. And then you have to produce a quote from your enclave. <coughs> and then this quote has to be sent to Intel's ISV server, which is a centralized server. I'll come back to that. I mean, it's, but essentially, for right now, for, for right now at, at the moment, the only way that you can verify an enclave is to send your quote to Intel's server. <coughs> Intel's server comes up with a uh, report and that report contains some um, SSL certificate that essentially proves that um, the quote has is, is been validated by Intel. So there are two certificates that, are, that have been being provided. Uh, one contains a signature that you can validate um, and the other one is the CA issued certificate of Intel. So essentially it comes down to, to verifying that the report that comes back has been signed by the Intel certificate, which is, uh, you know, is uh, authorized by CA. Bound yeah. to the application, or is it generic, like just just to, to verify that Enclave with such and such ID is, is or is it like, oh, yeah. do I also, like, the, the application is <coughs> running on Enclave, does it have to be signed by Intel, or does, does do I send some fingerprint of this application? Yeah, yeah, okay, so th there are, if I understand correctly, there are two things that are being verified uh, during this process. One, that the enclave is authentic, and two, that the code that is running on it is the only thing that's running on it, yes. So, like, our, our, our Enigma code, you know, which contains the platform itself, uh, is being verified as part of this uh, as part of this remote station. Process. So you have some certificate from Intel on this. Yeah. And then you verify that this is actually this code which is right. correct. Yes. So th these are the guarantees we have, right? That the enclave is uh, uh, an Intel enclave, yeah. and that it runs the code that um, Enigma wrote, mm -hmm. and that can be publicly audited separately. And then obviously from there we have other guarantees with regards to the inputs. So like if you accept that the, the, the Enigma code is the only code that runs in the enclave and nothing else, then we also have verifications on the inputs so that we can provide other guarantees that the inputs that have been provided to this particular task are the inputs that, um, that the, the, the user um, requested. Mm -hmm. so, mm. Okay, so ver verification from ISV is only required once per new work. Yeah, it's w required once. And then works for like... Yeah. Without connectivity. Correct, correct. Like the only ticket or like air gap off chain. Yeah. Off -line. That's right. The only reason why we would have to re verify is that if we change, for example, uh, Enigma, then we would redo the attestation process and, mm -hmm. uh, and have another uh, verification. And also, like this ISV server currently it's centralized, it's hosted by Intel. But uh, Intel just released fairly recent, recently an SDK that allows um, this sort of verification to be distributed. So we're looking into it. Uh, at the moment, I don't have the exact um, information about like how it's gonna work, how we're gonna make it work for us. 
but um, in the fairly uh, near future, we'll be able to potentially like, decentralize this ISV server where we can have nodes that are designated to basically verify other <coughs> nodes without having Intel in the middle. So that might alleviate some of the concerns with you know Intel being the bottleneck here, uh, or maybe a point of failure here. Like for example, if if so, if we take the case where maybe an enclave is faked, you know how can I, like how can an enclave be faked in this case? I think the only way to do it would be if uh, Intel is in cahoots with that. So let's say for example, if Intel decides, oh yeah, you know we want to. We're gonna decide to issue some fake certificates for the Enigma enclave. Mm -hmm. They could technically do that because they have their uh, Intel, you know, CA um, issued certificate. So they could theoretically like sign a uh, intermediary intermediary certificate and uh, approve some enclaves that are not real enclaves. But Intel will have to be in on that. So I think the chances of that are, are pretty small. But I think. Everyone will feel better once this centralized component is out of the picture and we can do the verification and then the mm -hmm. which is coming up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Another point with the, uh, with the testation at this um, is that, uh, so your verification, correct me if I'm wrong, but the verification comes from you verify the computation was done on the Intel SD, uh, Enclave with Intel, yes. and they go, they sign, they check a signature <coughs> or something, and go, this is a valid computation. Uh -huh. yeah. So what happens if you leak uh, the attestation key, and any further computations performed on that specific SGX are then compromised? It's not just one uh, on one uh, smart contract; it's all future contracts. Because yeah, because you because they have the attestation keys burned into the hardware. Yeah. So you'd have to replace the SGX, which would be just the CPU. Yeah, if you if you leak the attestation key of an enclave and no one catches this, then it's it's very bad news. It means that any computation that goes to this particular enclave, you could replicate yeah. its results and totally change it, leak it, whatever, and uh, there's nothing that we can do about it. Yeah. Okay, but if you had like an open source enclave that you could. Atte use uh, different attestation keys that would be more feasible? Yeah, I mean, like, first of all, uh, those enclaves shouldn't be, shouldn't leak their attestation key because otherwise, like, they shouldn't leak their signature key, otherwise they're useless, right? Like, the whole premise depends on if an enclave signs something with its, with its signature key, then um, it means that it's been done by the enclave. So if you can somehow get a hold of that key, you can sign anything and it mm. will look like it right. comes from an enclave. So, so can you do, besides the SMPC stuff, could you do a threshold uh, sort of computations? Where it's not just you know multi-part, it's just threshold based where maybe not all the enclaves, not one specific enclave has all the information for one specific contract. And you could split up some portions of that contract right now. <coughs> even, so it's not as going into as tech, could a developer do this, for example? Like you have multiple contracts, put them on different enclaves, on, yeah. put them up on different parts of the network, and then distribute the trust essentially so it's not all on just one enclave. Because for example, like I said earlier, foreshadow would leak the attestation keys of Intel SGX. So. Yeah, theoretically or in practice? It, in, what do you mean, for foreshadow? Yeah. Oh, in practice. It, it leaked the attestation keys, yeah. Yeah. That, that's bad. So we could yeah. split up the. So could a developer then actually like put different computations and different smart contracts and put them up on, you know, get different quotes for different people, <coughs> uh, perform one contract here, another one on a different machine, so that you can mitigate maybe some risk with that. Is that possible, or do you have to always do all your computations on one contract with one enclave? Yeah, you could create multiple contracts, which means that. Uh, those contracts would be done by multiple enclaves. Like you cannot predict if you create a contract, you cannot predict which enclave is gonna do the computation on it. They're always rotated every mm -hmm. epoch. They're selected randomly. So if you have uh, like okay. ten contracts, then you know you're gonna get a series of enclaves running your computations, and they're all, they're always gonna be rotated. So it's not like you're creating a contract, you deploy it, it's assigned to an enclave, and then that enclave is responsible for computing um, this contract forever it's it's always rotated um, but you know for that particular contract if something leaks if the the, the signature key leaks or you can read data from uh, from memory 
or, or whatever, then you know you're going to be able to read data about that contract, or, or maybe even modify the result of the computation for that contract. Okay. So you essentially just be able to say, "I'm an enclave." If it's not okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, that's why. I mean, you know, this is a big this is a big deal. That's why we're 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 working on NPC as fast as we can, so that it would then it would be a, a then it would be a real solution, right? Because if you were able to do that. You would only be able to modify yeah. Then you then you would need to know exactly which parties are yeah. performing. Okay, I see. Um, but at least in terms of correctness, uh, we do have a solution for it, which is again like to have a quorum of of, uh, <coughs> of enclave executing each task and then reporting on the results. So if a minority of the enclave come up with a different result, we know that there's been some tempering happening. But you know, they might have been able to read the data. You know, maybe the, the privacy is compromised. Okay. It's like a, it's so it's, a, it's very important for us to work with um, with IBM on these attacks and, and try to find some mitigations. And you know, you said the attack has been done practice. Again, I'm not the guys researching it exactly, so you know, I can't um, really say anything reassuring about it because I don't have all the information. But it's possible that we can do some things. Um, you know, with code and how we protect memory or different techniques to, to, to improve this and that's this is something that we're that we're working on as well. Okay. Uh, but I don't know I don't know all of the, the specifics about this particular app and, and how we can about potentially prevent it, but something we're taking very seriously and um, we're trying to find any kind of way to uh, to make it more secure. Okay. And one short question about the station yep. as well. If you send the code the source code of uh, the application to Intel, right? Yeah. Uh, is there a chance that they might reject it? Or like, do, do, if they just <coughs> to reject it, like, do they have some legal obligations? So like, how can you come up with this? I believe so. Although I don't know exactly what their guidelines are. We've sent some code and it's been approved before, uh, but okay. there might be a chance that it gets rejected if it doesn't fit their guidelines. But uh, to be honest, I'm not the one who's done it, and I don't know exactly what uh, would might make them reject it. Mm -hmm. But uh, we have a relationship with them, so we can. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's an issue for us, but I believe it's an it's an issue in general. Mm -hmm. uh, you cannot send anything to them. Uh, so does Intel know what contract to execute? Was that? Does Intel know what contract to execute? No, Intel doesn't know which contract oh, okay. to execute. They, are, they know the code for the platform that executes the contract. And the actual contracts themselves, uh, they are—they're part of the inputs of each computation session. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah. You have five minutes in case we want to cover something. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, just one thing I wanted to touch upon. Maybe this, like, um, just trying to clarify like how exactly we work with Ethereum. Um, so the way we work with Ethereum is that we have this, as I alluded to earlier, this task record. So like every time that a task is sent to Ethereum, we have this, uh, three minutes? Okay, so almost done. All right, so I don't know if it's worth going into it, but uh, the, the main point is that we're trying to work with Ethereum as efficiently as possible and uh, in a way that's as user-friendly as possible where you can take some ERC20 tokens, for example, that are, are on Ethereum and send them to uh, secret contracts and then have secret contracts output those tokens to um, another Ethereum address by doing a callback to other contracts. So we're trying to be very integrated with Ethereum uh, so that the Nema network is not sort of a sort of a, a silo that doesn't talk to Ethereum contract, but more like something that can supplement um, uh, Ethereum contracts. So, for example, if there are existing Ethereum DApps that need some privacy features, um, they can potentially use Enigma for a subset of their um, application and not have to rewrite the whole application on Enigma. And they will be able to transfer ERC20 tokens in that in, in, in that way and um, essentially like um, interoperate. So um, it's not just privacy; it's also the type of computation. Power yeah, the power. Okay, you can do something much more powerful. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that that, that is that that is uh, that is a, that is a great point. Like you can do much more powerful computation. Also, store much more data on the Enigma network than you would on the uh, on the Ethereum network. Um, so yeah, uh, that 
yeah, and, and all of these things are, are, are potentially useful in this and that, and we try to make it uh, as integrated as possible so that um, we can improve the existing Ethereum DAP and not just like creating a, a whole ecosystem that's not uh, related to Ethereum today. Hmm. Okay, so I think we're pretty much done, right? Yeah, thanks. <laughs>